Thank you guys for coming today. I'm so excited to be talking to you and welcome back from London. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on the gold. Um, you know, you dream about winning for, for months, years. Uh, you train for it every day. How does that dream match up with the reality of taking home the gold? Whoever wants to answer it can go. It's amazing. It's kind of a surreal experience to come home with a gold medal. And I mean, it is something that we've been training for for so long that it's, it's strange to have it in your hand and be like, wow, so here it is. You know, this is what I've been, this is what I've been doing all of this for. And it has culminated into something amazing. Mm -hmm. It's an indescribable feeling. So your team, I mean, you, you won your race only six days into the Olympics. How did you celebrate after that? What was the, the next week like for you? It's been well, a long uh, nine days. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just say that. It's been a very long nine days. Well, but most, most of our families have uh, came and watched us. And so, f so we won on Thursday, and most of them left on Sunday. So we had a lot of family time. But then we were kind of having this empty nest syndrome of, where are you? Where are you guys? And so the text started rolling in. and we kind of found each other again and we got to go to other events. We got to cheer on our fellow Team USA athletes mm -hmm. and uh, our feet hurt because we were walking all over the place, but it was a great experience. Did you stay in the Olympic Village? Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Uh, yeah, well, so we um, were actually one of the teams that for our competition stays offsite. So we're in the rowing village, which was for me and I think for, for all of us like very helpful because you, it allows you to like kind of put your head down, and you don't have ten thousand other athletes that are like your heroes. I was really hoping day. to hear good gossip well, about no, no. the Olympic but then, Village. But then um, we moved in a couple days after we finished our competition to the Olympic Village. Okay. So we got to have the whole, we got the best of both worlds. Um, so I mean, it, it's just as as Megan was saying, it's very surreal. You know, you you see the people that you read about in magazines or that you've seen on TV mm -hmm. since you were a little kid. You know, they're getting the train next to you in the dining hall. Right. Um, dining hall is the hot the spot. Yeah. Awesome. I would imagine any any like top spot. The top sightings, who were you most excited to meet? I saw Missy Franklin right outside our, our dorm area where Team USA was, mm -hmm. and I kind of acted like a little schoolgirl asking her for my picture, for a <laughs> picture of her, but super nice, and everyone, that was it. If you had the courage to go up to it, everyone just wanted to meet everybody, regardless if they were superstars or not. Everyone was excited yeah. and watched each other's race. Like, it was just surprising, like so many other uh, stars that we were starstruck by, they actually told us like we watched yeah. your race and it was flattering. That's got to be an amazing feeling. I, you know, my next question was really going to be what's this what's the feeling in the Olympic Village? Is it more competitive or is it a real sense of camaraderie for the US team? Yeah, I mean, I basically when you once you get there, the hardest part is getting there. And so once you get there, everybody just kind of has this weight off their shoulders and it's they're they're having a good time and like we like before our competition we were all in high spirits. I mean, the, literally the hardest part is the work to get there. And so everybody is just happy. And um, you know, it's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Sometimes some people are lucky to have it two or three times, but every single time you, you just uh, you know, try to relish it as much as possible. So rowing, maybe more so than any other Olympic event or many of them, is a real team sport. You've got eight women and a coxswain in the boat. So. How does it all come together? Mary, maybe you can tell me what a typical practice session looks like. Well, a typical practice session usually starts around 7 a.m., which is very thankful. We don't have to do the early morning sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, that lasts probably until about 9 when we're rolling into the locker room. And usually in the morning, that's where we do our kind of race intensity, kind of hard pieces. Then it depends on the day. We either have like a 90 minute break to either go to weights afterwards or go back on, a, on the water for a, a short technique row. So in the morning we're usually doing anywhere from 12 to 16K of mileage and then take a break and either do a short 8K row or lift weights. Then we get a main break of uh, shoveling food, rest, maybe uh, fit in a physical therapy session here and there. and then. Depends on practice. It either is at 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. depending on our schedules, and wow. that's anywhere from 12 to 16 k. It just it just depends on, on the week, the month, the, our training cycle, about the volume. Wow, that is yeah. impressive. Then we're done by six. Go home, <laughs> shovel food again, and sleep to recover to wake up again. It puts my three mile run in the morning like <laughs> to shame, to we, shame, to we shame. We always joke because we have like a. 20 minute warm up yeah. run in the morning. We always joke that we're like, this is going to be our workout someday. Yeah. Just go <laughs> do on 20 minute it. run yeah. and then go have our lattes. Yeah. Yes. But the reality it's of the fun. situation is, I don't think there are any girls in the team that someday only a 20 minute run will be their workout. 
You never know. Yeah, it got far off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Looks like an aspiration. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Um, we saw a study this week, actually. It came out during the Olympics that said that of all Olympians, rowers uh, have the best prospects for corporate futures, corporate success in the future. So I was just curious if you guys maybe want to share with us what's going on for you post-Olympics after this whole whirlwind dies down. Well, I've been nominated to do uh, the Team for Tomorrow, the United States Olympic Committee uh, program, where I'll be talking to Boys and Girls Club of America and YMCA and talk to kids about the healthy lifestyle of, you know, just, just be active. So important. Yes, and then also I'm doing speaking engagements with CEOs about leadership because I somehow tell these women what to do and they listen. <laughs> Uh, they graciously allow me to tell them what to do. So hopefully I have a little bit of tidbits of sharing people, you know, how do, how do we become a team and how do we appreciate each other. Mm, cool. Um, when I'm done, I'm going to go to nursing school. I want to be a nurse practitioner, actually. Oh, great. So. Um, and you're already, you're already accepted into a program? I was accepted into a program in 2000 and at the end of 2008 to start in 2009, but I got invited down to Princeton to train with the national team, so I had to defer, and then you can't defer for four years, so. <laughs> Um, I have to go through so the whole application. Yeah. application. I have process. to go back and apply again. <laughs> Fun. Um, so I actually uh, was one of the advice pieces of advice I got from some of the older the women who've been there um, in Beijing was that the Olympics after the Olympics it's not just for celebration but you can also do networking. Yeah. Um, because you have the chance to meet so many people who are excited about the Olympics who are you know sponsors and stuff there. Mm -hmm. So I actually. Um, when we when we're right when we get ready to compete, uh, we do fewer and fewer training sessions, and you have more and more energy. So I actually did some job applications while we were um, over getting ready to race, and um, so I don't I don't quite have anything set up yet, but um, some good prospects. So <laughs> well, uh, the odds are good. I mean, yeah. according to these hopefully. surveys, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'll hopefully be working with the uh, CrossFit community, which is just like a it's a global um, mm -hmm. strength and conditioning organization, and. Um, you know, I'm either, I do want to work with the business side of it and kind of develop my own um, end of it, but also, I don't know, I'm not done competing. <laughs> it's always going to be, it's always going to be there. So we'll see where, uh, where I'm going to get my next gold medal. <laughs> well, I think what makes rowers so driven is that we know how to back each other up and we know the importance of teamwork. Mm -hmm. And we also know, like, my success just does, isn't about me. It's about if I can make Megan and Esther and Aaron a better, I know collectively we will strive. And that's something we wanted to do on the race course is we were thinking about how can we back each other up mm -hmm. and not let each other down. And I think we were faster for that. And I think people can identify that in the workforce of, you know, if you're trying to just beat somebody to win, how is your whole company or how is your team going to be effective negatively or positively? So we're all about backing each other up. Very well said and, and sort of indicative of your future career as a motivational speaker. I hope, but we'll see. Very good. Okay, I, last question. I really want to talk to um, some advice for younger women, female athletes who might be interested in rowing. Um, I know it's something that a lot of women get into in college. So. Maybe, Megan, you could tell us about your start in rowing, and we could talk about some of your experiences. Um, I started rowing my freshman year of college at Ithaca College. It's kind of a small Division three program. Mm -hmm. um, and I rowed there for four years. I didn't really know that the national team even existed until after I graduated in 2005. So You guys are nodding. Is that a, like a common experience? I mean, I think, it, I think it depends. But I think when you're in college, for the most part, athletes tend to be focused on college, college rowing sports, because right. it's, it's extremely competitive, and it's a really great experience. Mm -hmm. um, but so I did that for four years. And then at the end of my four years, someone said, you know, you should try to go to development camp. And I was like, well, you know, what's that? And they're like, well, you can go on the national team. And I said, well, what's that? <laughs> and so I just kind of started the process of there's something beyond college if I wanted to pursue rowing and see if I could handle it. I mean, all of my teammates have gone to very large, huge rowing schools where the program is like funded well and it's Division One program and it's it's just a different path. The path I took was not like not laid out for me because all of my teammates worked for what they got and where they went. It was just a different way to get to the end of where I am now. Definitely an amazing story and one that tells that there isn't one singular path to an right. Olympic gold medal. Exactly. And it being the 40th anniversary for Title IX, I mean, I, it's, there's just going to be so, women's rowing is going to be so much more competitive and I think we're just the beginning of the success of it um, and just, you know, 
I started playing basketball in, in high school and wanted to play in college, but was recruited to row instead. And I think rowing used to be considered, oh, like a secondary, like, oh, if you can't do soccer or basketball or swimming, right. then, then you row. But I think rowing is going to be one of the top sports um, of women. In this well, nation. that's why we haven't lost a race in the eight for this is the seventh year in the row because I think we have a pipeline from the college, the college NCAA championships, and each one of us were pretty much leaders of our own colleges. Mm -hmm. Go dogs! I was from the University of Washington. <laughs> we all have collegiate pride, yeah. but we also realize that uh, we have to have a positive team atmosphere for one goal to, you know, get our gold medal. You have awesome. to be very independently motivated, like internally. Because I mean, rowing is not one of those high-paying sports where you get a big check at the end of the month or the end <laughs> of the year. You know, you you do do it for yourself and your teammates, mm -hmm. and it it's rewarding. it's it's very rewarding. I mean, yeah, you don't get a big check, but you get each other, and to be able to know that like there is not one other person in your boat that isn't pulling for you and wants to do it for you as well as themselves. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, sort of building off of what Erin was saying, it's interesting because I'm like, there's a couple of us on the team whose parents actually were rowers also. Oh, right. Um, so my parents actually rowed um, for a long time and tried for the national team in the in the 70s and 80s. And mm -hmm. um, my mom was one of the first women to come in after Title IX was sort of started to be enforced. Right. And to see the difference in opportunities, the fact that, you know, regardless of what school we were in, like we had um, boats to row in or you know showers available somewhere on campus you know things like that and which were experiences that your mother didn't right have. right, she, right. They, if they wanted to shower they had to use the men's boathouse and there was no lo separate locker room or anything like that wow. um, so like seeing how far we've come since those opportunities for women became available um, I just can't wait for all of us to help the next generation of girls like to be inspired to reach for you know mm -hmm. more quality and, and bigger opportunities it's remarkable